So go terms and go enrichment. So um, one question that always comes up, well, what are go terms? And um, uh, go terms are really, uh, and again, for the purpose of our talk, um, we're, we're talking about, um, well, I'll tell you about go terms in a second, but, but go, go stands for uh, gene ontology. And an ontology in our sense is, uh, at least for our purposes, uh, is really a formal description of a particular field and the relationship between uh, the, the, the different uh, aspects of that field. And so, for example, you can look at science, the field of science, and you can break it up into uh, formal sciences, natural sciences, and social sciences. And then each one of these can be broken up into like, uh, you know, formal science can be logic and mathematics, natural science can be life uh, and biological sciences or physical sciences, social sciences can be sociology. And there can be connections between these and linkages between them. But this is the formal description or a formal description of science. And then each one of these will then subcategorize into, you know, probably hundreds of, of subcategories. And in fact, if we look at life and biological sciences, there is a, um, um, a, a pretty cool uh, ontology that describes uh, life and biological sciences, and that's the gene ontology. And the gene ontology really describes the knowledge uh, of biological sciences, and it divides that knowledge into uh, three broad categories. And these categories are molecular function, cellular component, and biological process. Okay? And if we look at those in a bit more detail, the molecular function describes activities uh, at the molecular level, okay? So performed by a gene. So for example, toxin activity or transporter activity. The cellular component talks about where the function of a gene is taking place. So for example, if the gene is functioning in the apicoplast, it might get a plastid uh, gene ontology associated with it. Or if it's in a mitochondria, it'll get a mitochondrial gene ontology term associated with it. And those could be subcategorized. You could have mitochondrial in a you know, membrane compartment or, or, uh, or other obviously sub categorizations. And finally, the biological pro process, and that's really, it, it talks about a, a, a process that a gene is involved in, like pyrimidine biosynthesis, where there'll be many genes that are involved in that process and, and that ontology can be associated with your gene, which may be a, one of the enzymes in, in the pyrimidine biosynthetic pathway. And these relationships are hierarchical. So, you know, you could have a, uh, a, a go term that's for plastid, and then below it could be another term for chloroplast. That's a, a, a child of the plastid, basically. You could have another go term maybe for apicoplast. So even though apicoplast and chloroplast are both belong to plastid, they also can be separated into subcategories that distinguish them from each other. And so here's a, just a general example of where an ontology is quite useful. So this organelle here is a cyanel, uh, and this one is a chloroplast, and this is an apicoplast, but all of them are plastids. Okay? So they all would fall under uh, the, the plastid uh, gene ontology. And in fact, if you have a gene um, that functions in the apicoplast and a gene in the, in the plants that functions in the chloroplast and one that functions in cyanels, they can be all connected to each other by virtue of, of getting assigned a go term for plastid. Okay, and so now this becomes very advantageous for finding connections across the tree of life or within a particular organism, if you're able to take all the genes that, are, that function in the apicoplast and give them um, the go term for plastid, well, now you have something that unifies them because um, you know, there's no way for you to know just by looking at the name of the gene, if this is an acyl carrier protein or a ferrodoxin and ADPH reductase, that both of these actually function in the plastid unless they both are, are, are like have information that, that says that they are. And the GO terms allow you to do that. Now, once you have that, once you're able to categorize genes based on their GO function or GO terms, now you can use that information, that knowledge, to start looking for enrichment. So if you have a set of genes, and you're asking, well, you know, is there something interesting in my set of genes that's happening more than random, right? Having these go terms allows you to use a, a, a standardized way to actually ask that question and then uh, run some statistics on it and say, well, yes, statistically, I'm seeing, uh, you know, a higher than random occurrence of the go term for plastic in my gene set, right? So maybe, you know, this upregulation under this stage is causing an increase in plastid activity. And that's, that's sort of how, how this is used. Okay, and there's a lot of 
a lot more information under this uh, uh, gene ontology page here. Um, and there are other resources. The exercise has a number of additional resources at the end of it in the appendix. So you'll be able to link to it. And uh, I'll make these, we'll make these also available on the, um, uh, on the website. I'll put them up later today. So you'll have access to this, uh, uh, to this exercise, uh, to this uh, lecture. Uh, it does have a few more slides on, on enzyme commission uh, numbers. We won't talk about those today, but uh, it'll be a, a nice way for you to, to learn about those as well. Okay. So there are different ways to look at go enrichment. Typically, people do a, what's called a Fisher's exact test. Um, and, um, and of course, this generates p-values, which tells you something about you know, whether what you're seeing is, is, is random or, or, uh, or potentially real. Um, but often what you have to do when you have large uh, uh, samples, basically, and large, essentially large number of tests, because every single gene can be considered a test in this case, um, you have to correct for the p-value. So the Fisher's exact test p-value may be misleading because you can have things that look like they have a really high p-value, but really because of the size of the sample, they may actually not be that significant. And so there are different ways of correcting these p-values. And in fact, our analyses that we do in, in the website uh, provide you all of this. So this is an example of um, an output and you'll be doing this on your own today. So you'll get an output like this of a go enrichment analysis and uh, you'll get a number of numbers, but including these p-values, but you'll notice you have both these uh, Benjamini and bon Bonferroni um, uh, corrections. Um, and both of these typically are, well, they will be lower than your Fisher's exact test p-value. And those obviously depending on uh, the results you're getting, uh, you might, uh, it's always important to look at these corrected p-values for sure. Uh, often they're both, you know, if it's really significant, then both of them are, are quite significant. But in, in there are cases where you will, a p-value looks significant, but then your correction actually does not look significant. And that's something you have to take into account uh, when you do these analyses. Okay, so let's get back to the exercise. And so this exercise will be on go enrichment. And I think uh, unless there are any general questions i'm trying to see the chat if there's anything specific here we need to cover i don't think so so sam let's go ahead and break out into our breakout rooms unless there are any other comments from any of the other instructors that i missed something people happy okay let's uh, head back to our breakout rooms okay i'll send you to your breakout rooms Please just accept the messages.